Francois, good evening, and welcome to today's, to today's presentation on uh, Métropole du Grand Paris, Planning and Integrating the Paris Metropolitan Region by Catherine Barbet, the Director of Strategic, Planning, uh, Strategic Partnerships at the Société du Grand Paris. My name is Michel Trocme. I'm a design partner at Urban Strategies here in Toronto. <coughs> the talk is the culminating uh, event in a three-day forum where six French urbanists have met with Canadian planners at the province, at Metrolinx, and at the cities of Toronto and Markham, sharing their experiences and discussing best practices in terms of transportation and regional planning. This Canadian French planning forum has been a collaboration between the Bousfield Distinguished Visitorship in Planning at the Department of Geography University of Toronto and the Consulat General de France in Toronto with support from the Institut Francais. The visitorship honors John Bousfield, a distinguished Canadian urban planner, now in his 61st year of professional practice, and enables the planning program to bring to the university accomplished individuals who can teach, give public lectures, and participate in collaborative research projects on issues important to the field of planning. In addition to our keynote speaker, Catherine Barbet, French delegates in the forum are Mireille Appelmuller, Director General of the Institut pour la Ville en Mouvement in Paris, Tanya Conco, founding principal of Tanya Conco Architects Urbanists from Amsterdam, Alfred Peter, founding principal of Atelier Alfred Peter in Strasbourg, France, Guillaume Poiret, professor at the Université Paris Est, Créteil in Paris, and Jonathan Nass, the, uh, the Department of Mobility and Transport at the Communauté Urbaine de Strasbourg. Um, in order to welcome you all, um, all of you French uh, visitors, we've made a special arrangement tonight uh, to give you a demonstration of urban snowstorm um, in, uh, in the city of Toronto. So you will see, hopefully, uh, firsthand how a city like, like ours responds to, to climate. Tonight's presentation is in association with Big Cities, Big Ideas, a series which was started a couple of years ago and is co-sponsored co by Global Cities Institute, the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governments, the Martin Prosperity Institute, the Monk School of Global Affairs, the School of Public Policy and Governments, Governance, all of these at the University of Toronto, and Urban Strategies Incorporated. After the presentation, Teresa Enright and Larry Clay will provide responses and lead a short conversation with Catherine Barbet before we open uh, to questions from the audience. Uh, we'll break at 8 p.m., uh, at which time you will all, all be invited to join us downstairs for a reception uh, in the foyer. Before I introduce tonight's guest speaker, I'd like to invite Monsieur Jean-François Cassabon Massonave, the Consul General of France in Toronto, to make a few remarks. Monsieur Cassabon Massonave has a licence, which is a bachelor's degree, in history, a maîtrise, which is a master's degree, in public law, a degree from the Institut d'études politiques of Toulouse in France. He entered the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1987 and has had a wide range of appointments, including Paris, Vietnam, Indonesia, Japan, and Tunisia. In September 2012, Monsieur Casabon Massonave was appointed Consul General of France here in Toronto. Please welcome Monsieur Casabon Massonave. Thank you very much. Bonsoir, Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and Gentlemen. I am delighted to be here with you tonight on closing day of this French Canadian Urbanism Forum dedicated to regional planning and transportation. For the past three days, six distinguished guests from France who are there uh, had the opportunity to see the success and challenges Toronto and the surrounding region are facing for themselves. 
They also shared their knowledges and experiences and discussed regional growth and transportation issues with many professional planners and city builders in the region, including many, many of you in this room. Cities and their metropolitan regions in both France and Canada are facing many similar challenges and, more importantly, lessons for each other. Here in Toronto, the idea for planning for the whole wider Toronto region began in early 2000. For Paris, integrating the city core to their surrounding region began in 2007 when former President Nicolas Sarkozy launched uh, an initiative to create a new global plan for a unified Paris metropolitan area. And I have to say that that was just the end of several steps of discussion and, dis and uh, debates. It took a long time before. Uh, it takes the form of Le Grand Paris, and we're looking forward to hearing more about its concept and strategies from Catherine Barbet in a few minutes, and I'm so sorry for not being able to stay. But uh, Toronto is a brilliant and vibrant city, and so many events in the same time, so I have to cut myself in two parts, <laughs> or to jump from one place to another one. I want to thank all the delegates for taking part in this forum, as well as all the, the organizations and institutions who made this forum possible. I also want to particularly thank Paul Hess from the University of Toronto Geography and Planning Department and Edwi, Edwin Lee, I don't have my glasses, Edwin, he's here, <laughs> just there, uh, for their valuable contribution to the symposium. And I don't want to forget uh, Marang Dumba from the Consulate who uh, played a major role in the success of this event too. Such an event would not have been possible without their involvement. I hope this forum through the discourses, meetings and field visits enabled our planners and city builders to bring about long-term collabor collaborations on planning and transportation initiative between France and Canada. And to tell the truth, we are already starting to work on the next steps uh, of cooperation between uh, France and Canada, between uh, Paris and Toronto uh, in that field. Okay. Thank you very much. Catherine Barbet is the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Société du Grand Paris, <clears throat> a state agency commissioned to design and implement the significant expansion of regional rail, metro, and light rail network uh, in, in the Paris metropolitan area and oversee urban development around future stations. She previously served as the Director of Development and Planning at the Société du Grand Paris. Prior to joining the Société du Grand Paris, Catherine was commissioned by the mayor of Paris in 2008 to prepare the establishment of the, sustain, of the Sustainable Cities Institute, focusing on sustainable urban policy research. From 2001 to 2008, Catherine served as the executive director of the City of Paris' Department of City Planning, where she established the implement and implemented medium and long-term planning and development policies. Earlier, while with the Ministry of Public Works, Catherine led the development of a national planning and housing strategy where she developed and implemented the Solidary and Urban Renewal, SRU, Act that transformed planning regulations and procedures of public urban development in France. Catherine is an architect and a graduate of the Institut d'études politiques de Paris, which is the Institute of Political Studies in, in Paris. Um, and the National School of Administration. She is also a member of the scientific committee of an urban solutions think tank, La Fabrique de la Cité, which is the, the city factory. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Barbet. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before the presentation, we have a small film to bring you into the context of the Grand Paris project. Is it possible to launch it? Aujourd'hui en Ile-de-France, près de 80% des déplacements de banlieue à banlieue se font en voiture, faute d'une offre de transport en commun suffisante et adaptée. 
Les rocades routières existent, à 86, périphériques, mais les transports en commun restent organisés en étoile. En RER ou en métro, il est souvent nécessaire de repasser par Paris. 8 millions et demi de voyageurs franciliens souffrent régulièrement de cette situation. Le réseau est saturé, la qualité de vie est affectée. Parfois, c'est l'accès à l'emploi qui est menacé, alors que le développement et l'attractivité de la région Île-de-France et de notre pays réclament des échanges plus pratiques et plus rapides. Le nouveau Grand Paris des transports prévoit 12 milliards d'euros pour la modernisation des RER et l'extension du réseau existant. Il prévoit aussi 22,6 milliards d'euros pour le Grand Paris Express. Le Grand Paris Express allège le trafic sur le réseau existant, notamment dans la zone dense. Il facilite les déplacements grâce à des correspondances efficaces. C'est aussi un projet au service du développement des territoires. Il rapproche domicile et lieux de travail, relie les quartiers aux pôles de formation, d'emploi et de santé et rend plus accessibles les activités de loisirs. La construction des différentes lignes du Grand Paris Express est lancée en parallèle. Elles se compléteront au fur et à mesure entre 2019 et 2030. So, I'm now going to present you the main characteristics of the Grand Paris project. Um, my presentation is divided in five parts. So I'll first show you, well, describe you the urban context of the Paris region. Um, then I think it's important to, important to share the main trends in transport and, and mobility in the Paris region. And then, of course, I'll have to describe the Grand Paris Express project. Um, then, in the fourth part, uh, I will try to explain you the expected contribution of the Grand Paris project to urban development in the Paris region. And I'll finish by a few, a few explanations uh, about the Grand, Greater Paris Authority, which is being set up at the moment. So here are the main points. Let us start with the urban context. Um, you certainly know that uh, Greater Paris is the larger metropolis in Europe. Well, that's what we say. but. Uh, We're quite convinced of it. Um, in fact, it's more the, Grand Paris, the Paris region than the greater Paris, in fact. The Paris region is uh, 11.7 million inhabitants and 5.7 million jobs. But its uh, area, it's 12,000 square kilometers. So it's a large region, not as big as your region. We discussed that point on, the, on Monday. But quite a large region, and the region is composed of 80% of agricultural and natural land. So it's not exactly the, the good skill for a metropolis description. That's why we, we talk more and more of Greater Paris, Greater Paris metropolis, and even if the metropolis has no legal existence yet, we'll discuss that point at, at the end of my presentation, Uh, in terms of geo urban geography, it's much more effective. And the Greater Paris Metropolis is around 7 million people, uh, and its area, it's 800 square kilometers, so something quite comparable to the area of, to of Greater Toronto, as far as I understood. So, as I said, the urban context. First, a few information uh, about urbanization that like in many metropolis, has sprawled in the last 60 years. You see the red points show that what the new settlements in this period of time, and the green points show where the population has decreased. And you see the scale uh, of the uh, distance from the center of Paris. Uh, here is 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers, blah, blah, blah. So you see that the urbanization has sprawled particularly in this ring at a certain distance from the center, but not further on. But even though uh, housing is still concentrated in the central area, and you see that map shows the concentration of housing, um, and you see that the density of population 
is very high in the center, especially uh, on the, uh, in the city of Paris, which is in the center, where you can find density of 50 uh, inhabitants per hectare, which is very high, probably one of the highest in the world. But once you get outside Paris, here are the Paris border, the city of Paris border, uh, then it's much lower, but still you can find density between 100 and, two and 250,000 um, people per hectare, so it's still very uh, high in density compared with the rest of the Paris region. And on this map you see the borders of the various uh, counties, but you see also a line with dots, and that's the Grand Paris project uh, network which is drawn on that and you see that the Grand Paris project has been set up in the most densest part of the um, Paris uh, region where the population is there and the density is already partly there so that it can help the development and the intensification of this area. Um, the problem is that the natural trend nowadays uh, is that housing construction concentrates mainly now in suburban areas. Uh, the, green, the dark green spots are where there has been uh, a high number of housing being built in the past 10 years. So it's far away from the center, it's far away from the uh, network of the Grand Paris Express, and this is not good for uh, the general um, time of uh, travel to work of the inhabitants. Uh, it's not good also because job remains concentrate in central Paris and immediate outskirts. Uh, the darker parts show that there are more than 300 jobs per hectare, uh, so not only in Paris but in La Défense for instance and also in Saint-Denis or in this part just close to the Paris border. Um, and so the distances between jobs and home get longer, and if there is no public policy to change this tendency, it will get worse and worse, which is not good at all. And last uh, characteristic of the urban context is um, the social division that is still fairly strong between the northeast part of the Paris region, of the Paris metropolis, and the southwest part of it. The green, um, the green areas is, are the, these where um, there's the highest proportion of higher management, while the pink, pink areas are those where there are the highest proportion of employees and workers. So you see that the contrast is very strong, uh, and um, it's um, very important characteristics of public policies at any level of government to reduce, uh, to try to reduce social and territorial inequities that are shown through this map. So the Grand Prix Express network is also, as you see, going through many deprived areas, always aligned with the dots, and um, it is one of the characteristics of this project is to help, well, to try to have the people who live in these areas to get in a shorter time to the areas where are, there are the higher concentration of jobs, so either um, white collar jobs like in La Défense or in, the, in Paris, or not so qualified job in the airports, for instance, in the areas around the airports. So here are the main characteristics of urban, um, urban region. Now a few words about the main trends in transport and mobility in the Paris region. Uh, first of all, very important car use is decreasing, except it in the outer suburb. So it's perhaps a bit difficult to understand this slide uh, because it's, you're far away, you don't see much of it. Um, there are three different diagrams. The first one on the left shows the tendency um, in transit. Uh, in the middle, car, uh, car use, and on the right side, walking. So you see that walking is going up everywhere. Um, everywhere, that means more particularly on the dark green line which describes the Paris situation. Not so much on the light green line which describes 
the situation of the people living in the outer suburbs. Um, but, and the red line is a medium, so it's a general tendency for all the inhabitants of the Paris region. Uh, but you see also that the use of public transport, of transit, is much higher in the Paris, in the city of Paris, dark green, than in the out, outer uh, suburbs, but the tendency is higher, while the car use is declining very quickly in Paris. Uh, the use of car, the traffic, has decreased for 35% uh, in, uh, in the past 10 years, since the beginning of, uh, of the years 2000. It's not, the tendency is not so high in the other parts of the region. It's still slowly increasing in the very, in the outer part of the Paris region, but though the tendency, the general tendency has reversed now, and car use is not that much. Uh, in this period of time, in fact, you don't see it so strongly on the statistics, but the, uh, you, the use of transit has increased by 20% between 2001 and 2010. So it is very high. It means that in 2010, there are 8 million trips a day uh, in transit, and it was not expected by um, the transit authority and the local authorities. So that's probably why they have taken the decision to invest a lot in transit, because the pressure on the existing infrastructure is very, very high. So a few more information. Um, only retired people still um, use, uh, well, have a, an increasing use of cars, but the rest of the um, population category are slowly letting down cars. And uh, this, that's what is shown. Retired people is at the top. Students, unemployed people, non-working people, low industry occupation lower service occupation, higher managerial and professional occupation, small employers. The use of private car is in red. The use of public transport is in blue, uh, purple. And uh, you see that it's, the car use is decreasing everywhere, except for retired people at the top of the graph. Uh, one, more, one more figure just to say that, that, just to show that transit increases and increases during all the period of the day, not only at the, peak, at the morning peak hour and at, at the evening peak hour, but also during the whole day. So um, it is a general improvement and also a tendency, but you probably have the same sort of tendency um, in the mobility, uh, is that uh, the increase of non-job mobility is very high and that now only 30% of travels and 50% of distances uh, covered are linked to job activity. The rest of it is for everyday life. And uh, it explains also part of the increase in transit demand that I've uh, underlined previously. And this tendency, but you also have it probably in here, that the use of transit is changing and there's a lot of more demand for information on time about the uh, transit facilities provided. So now let's, go, let's come to the core of the subject of what is the Grand Paris project. Um, so the Grand Paris project has been um, decided by a national law. The Act on Grand Paris was voted in 2010 and it's not a detail, it's very important because it was the first time since, I don't know, 50 years perhaps, uh, that the national parliament voted um, a law to organize um, the Paris region and to spend money in the Paris region, even if this money, in fact, is collected only on the Paris region uh, inhabitants and enterprise. But it's a national decision and it's a decision that shows, um, how could I say, the fact that um, all the politi all politicians in France have now uh, understood that the Paris region is the engine for the national economy, and that if the Paris region is declining, the national economy is declining as well. 
Those of you who are uh, either students or professors in planning know that uh, since uh, after World War II, national politics in France have always favored the rest of the territory against the Paris region. Decentralization, but also decentralization of activities, of public investment, uh, of public enterprise has been a tendency. And now, through the Greater Paris Act, it shows that it, it, it has reversed, at least, at the end. <laughs> it's meant for it. Sometimes I forget. Uh, so it's, of course, a project that should improve everyday life once it's achieved. Uh, contribute to economic development. I've said it in other words. Open at, open at secluded areas. I've said that already, and this is particularly important on this section of the network where the poorest areas of the region and the poorest uh, social housing areas uh, and the states are um, located, and also it should relieve congestion. So it's 200, 205 kilometers network, 69 stations. Um, it's not really new stations, it's stations in the Grand Paris Express project, but most of them are existing stations, and there are existing stations in the main line, either railway line or metro line, that are uh, driving through Paris, because the problem is in the Paris network is very uh, dense in Paris, not so dense in the outskirts, but it's all concentrated towards Paris, and you have to go through Paris, uh, to go from one point of the suburb to the next point of the suburb, even if it's distant of 10 kilometers. So it is real progress, it is a network. For instance, um, here is an example uh, between Champigny Centre and ici RER, so that's just in the south part of the suburb. Um, today, one hour uh, and 20, 26 minutes, because you have to take a bus, you have to take RER, you have to take a metro line and another RER, and with the Grand Prix project, it will be no change, and 20, 27 minutes, so a lot of uh, time saved. Uh, another one that had disappeared, so uh, <laughs> probably the slide suffered during the way. Sorry, it was just an example for the professors working in Paris University, but uh, <laughs> don't worry, we'll build it anyway, so. <laughs> Okay, uh, and uh, so this is the first section to be built. So you've seen the example between Champigny and DC, but this first section, um, the, the works, building works will start next year, so it's, very, it's coming very soon. 16 stations, 22 municipalities, four uh, counties that are, well, the line is going through, 33 kilometers of line, and, uh, well, you can read as well as me, uh, 35,000 travelers at morning peak hour, and probably an estimated number of 250,000 to 300,000 travelers a day in the week time. Okay. Um, it will be built in several simultaneous simul building sites. Uh, so, as I said, this will start next year, and this first section is due to open uh, in 2020. So, the whole program is such, um, at the beginning, there's a very small part that is being built at the moment by the metro, um, by the Paris Metro, RATP, uh, then, as I said, the works for this part of the line, the section, the south section of the 915 line, because it has, these lines have got numbers now, numbers in the sequence of the metro, in fact, the Paris metro. So there are 14 lines in the Paris metro, and the lines we're building are named 15, 16, 17, 18, so just in the continuity. So anyway, um, this um, section, um, is, is due to open in 2020. The next one uh, is due to open in 2023. Uh, it's 
the section that is going through this very deprived area of the northeast of Paris. And so it's important to connect the people who live there and have no public transport at the moment to um, the rest of the metropolis so that they could have a much shorter time, really shorter time in transport to get to the places where the jobs are located. Um, this, the rest of it will be built also in 2024. That's the connection to the airport, uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport there, Orly Airport there, and also part of the connection to the new uh, university area of Saclay, which is uh, also a very big project at the moment, and where in 2030, 20% of the research, public and private research in France should be concentrated. So it's something very important as well. So here is the schedule launches. A few information now about cost and financing. So some of my colleagues keep believing that it, uh, it is not finance, it is finance. Uh, and it is finance, well, very easily. So I give you the recipe. Um, it's local tax. Local tax, some of, some of it existed already. Uh, it's um, the annual tax on all office premises in the Paris region. Um, this tax has, had not been indexed, so it was at a very low level. So the Greater Paris Act in 2010 had um, le put it at a higher level and uh, has indexed it, in fact, and also decided that some of the product of it, not all of it, should be directed to the city of Paris, to the, sorry, uh, the Société du Grand Paris to finance the project. So it's um, now 350 million uh, euros a year uh, that it goes direct from the uh, collectors the, to, this, to the, the Société du Grand Paris. Uh, another one that's a new tax that has been created, it's a tax, um, an additional tax on all households of the Paris region, but only the Paris region, I insist, not the rest of France, it's only the Paris region that pays for the Grand Metro, the Grand Paris Express. Uh, and this special tax on all households uh, brings uh, 117 million uh, euros a year. Uh, it's not very high for ho households, it's just 15 euro a year, but the amount of it brings a lot of money to the Société du Grand Paris. Uh, and the last one is a 60 million euro tax on trains that are circulating in the Paris region. So the total of it brings 500 million euros each year to the city, to the Société du Grand Paris. So it's not enough to pay for the whole um, expenditure, which as you read before I said it, uh, is 23.5 billion investment. But it's a lot of money and it should normally enable us to borrow the rest of it and the uh, European Bank is ready to lend us some money and the uh, state bank, the Caisse des Depots, uh, is ready to lend us the rest of it. So uh, the financing of it is prepared now and normally uh, it, should be, uh, it should be all right. Um, some of it has been spent already, in fact, because uh, the um, the Board of Administrators of the Société du Grand Paris has already voted uh, more than 8 billion expenditures to finance the building of the first section and the second section. So it's really on the way uh, also in terms of decision and political decision, not only in terms of getting uh, the funding on time. So perhaps a few words on the economic impact of the project. Um, the evaluation of the economic impact of a project is a compulsory procedure for all national public investments. For instance, a new fast train line or that sort of expenditure. So we had to do it. And um, it's also always interesting to ask yourself a question, what should it bring in terms of economic impact? So 
there's of course um, the we automatically we think of transport users benefit uh, the valuation of time the regularity uh, the reduction of congestion and economists are used to give a value to that but there are also indirect effect and I think as a planner there are the most most important ones like for instance value of spared non-urban areas uh, because it will con well it will concentrate it should concentrate urbanization in the central area it's spared uh, urban it spares sorry uh, natural land from urbanization so it can be also valued um, it saves also uh, the outskirts the municipality located in the outskirts to spend money to build uh, new amenities because urbanization should concentrate in the central area where these amenities already exist. Um, and there are also probably wider economic benefit, it has been calculated by the economists at least, that is uh, the um, benefits brought by the agglomeration effect uh, when you concentrate activities and job in a central area, it's more efficient than it, when it is spread on the bigger territory. Um, it will uh, also move job to more productive areas and the example of the uh, Sackley um, scientific location is one of the uh, examples. And also we calculated that it should bring additional growth, additional growth in terms of employment and it has been evaluated between uh, 115,000 and 315,000 new jobs created. Well, that the economist who did it, I'm not sure, we don't know, but at least we have to um, try to um, believe that. Why not, I would say. Uh, and of course, the reduction of social inequalities, but the reduction of social inequalities, unfortunately, we can't figure it, but it probably exists. So here are the figures. I won't stay long on that, uh, but it's, the exercise has been done. Uh, I think I've been a bit long now, so I'll try to be faster on what, is, what I prefer, the expected contribution to urban development. Um, as I said, uh, the urban strategy of the Grand Paris is shared by all the uh, level of governments, either national, county level, regional level, municipality level, uh, and we all think that uh, it will reinforce greater Paris attractiveness, um, help to uh, build more housing units. The Grand Paris Act says that it should enable to bring to build 70,000 uh, uh, housing units a year. We just built half of it nowadays each year, so there's a great step to be made. Uh, but it's really uh, a project that brings a lot of cohesion to the political uh, decision, decisions in the Paris area at the moment. Everybody loves the Grand Paris. I hope it will last as long as possible. Uh, so you see that there are ma major urban projects around the Grand Paris uh, project. Uh, I won't describe all of them, but um, the blue ones are the research and higher education sites, like uh, the Paris Saclay, but other ones as well. Um, the red wine are the traditional business district that already exist, but that will get more dynamism from the project, like of course La Défense, but also saint ni player where we're located, uh, and which is now the third um, business district in the Paris region, and also many other projects uh, that are located more or less close to the uh, coming new stations of the Grand Prairie project. And also, uh, there is also a potential for new urbanization around the stations, not only existing projects or existing locations, but uh, a potential uh, that uh, we've tried to calculate and estimate. And, um, well, I won't go into the details of it, but the, what is in the circles around the stations, that, uh, an average of 200 hectares around each station, because we've taken a circle with a radius of 800 meters. And um, it's, uh, when adding all these circles, it's more than 138 square kilometers. That's a territory which is bigger than the city of Paris itself. 
which is only 100 square kilometers. So it just says that if there is an, a concentration on um, changing planning rules, um, moving to more development in these circles only, it will bring a lot of potential to new urbanization. So a few more details about how to generate new urbanization, uh, okay, around the station, but also by limiting the urban extensions thanks to regional planning regulation. We discussed that on Monday also, and the regional plan that was adopted uh, in December 2013 by the region, by the Paris region, is, has very strong uh, regulations on that uh, particular, um, me, particular issue. Uh, also, another possibility is the regeneration of former industrial zones, because there are many former industrial zones in the very central part of the great, greater Paris area, close to many uh, Grand Paris future station. And also, there could be some possibility in densification of traditional urban neighborhoods with many uh, small houses, but I'm not sure that any politician will change planning regulations in this particular area. Anyway, we have tried to identify the real estate potentials, um, and we now, um, I, I, I led that study a few years ago and it was very interesting to show that there was a lot of potential around the stations. Uh, the state, uh, through a disposition of the Grand Prix Act, had also uh, contracted with the uh, municipalities uh, to define mutual commitment to develop the territories under the new station influence. It has been called Territory Development Projects, Contrat de Développement Territorial for Specialists. Um, another possibility is to develop the urban projects close to the station, and I showed you the map previously. And also, the Société du Grand Paris tries, uh, whenever it's possible, to build new housing uh, above the stations we're going to build or next to it. It will not build, it, it will not bring many, many new dwellings, but it's a tendency, it's to show the example, and it's a good possibility uh, to show the mayors that it's possible to build around the stations, and uh, some of them then have already accepted to let us build and to build themselves on the premises around the stations. So here are some possibilities. Unfortunately, we probably have some difficulties that could come up, but these difficulties, you probably have to face the same uh, in Canada. Um, for instance, inhabitants are reluctant reluctant to accept a, a, high, a higher density in their neighborhoods, so there should be a lot of discussion. Um, perhaps more important, the cost, of, the cost of urban regeneration of bronze fields is very high, as you know, because uh, we have to bring services, we have to depolluate uh, these brown fields, we have to finance the length of the uh, development, so it's really a, a handicap, a drawback, to develop these potentials. Um, the fact also that urban development procedures are very long, uh, so it will take a lot of time to reach this uh, purpose objective of 70,000 uh, dwellings a year. And also, um, we must face the fact that there's a weak attractiveness from, of the, some of these cut-off territories uh, that, concentrates, that still concentrate a high level of social difficulties. But there are some success factors. Um, we are all convinced, and also all politicians, as I said, that it will bring a better service to the metropolitan area, that it will increase the value of any new urban development located around the station, and that it will give more visibility to the Grand Paris project. And to conclude, a few words about the Greater Paris Authority and the move towards this Greater Paris Authority. The Grand Paris project, the Grand Paris Express project is only a tra transit project, but as I told you, it has some um, national importance just because it has been decided by the parliament. It is an act that has, that has created the Grand Paris project uh, and the Société du Grand Paris, in fact. Um, 
that was a previous government that decided it. The new government has decided to change the governance of the Paris region. And this is also a great step that is being performed at the moment. Um, last year, um, a project has been brought to Parliament to create a metropolis in the, in the greater Paris area. And it was a metropolis with very light competence. But the Parliament has decided to make it stronger. And so the law that has been voted at the end of 2013 and is now um, effective since the beginning of, year, of this year has created a metropolis that has much stronger powers than what was previously uh, thought by the government. So here is the situation now. You see that there is an extreme territorial fragmentation, probably much worse than what you experience in Canada. Uh, in the Paris region, well, I told you the Paris region is very large, 12,000 uh, kilo square kilometers, but there are 1,300 municipalities. So just imagine what it is. Okay, the small villages in seine marne and Essen, but also around Paris, there are many, many municipalities. Um, look at that. That is the map of the existing municipalities around Paris. Uh, so here is the compulsory border of the new metropolitan authority. And the municipalities between the two, the two green lines are optional. They can decide either to integrate the Grand Paris uh, metropolis or not to. But anyway, uh, what, the, what the map shows also is extreme fragmentation of municipalities all around Paris. You, don't, you can't read the figures, but the, the number of inhabitants is more or less around an average of 40,000 for each municipality, between 10,000 and 100,000, not more. So it's very small. And there has been a process of um, cooperation between all these municipalities that has started very late in the Paris region. And so the borders of the territories that cooperate together are in different colors. And you see that it's a process that hasn't been achieved yet because all the white territories are the municipalities that are still playing alone, in fact, and not collaborating with the other ones. So it's still a lot of them. And so um, the metropolitan process will try to build on this territory, as I said, at least the minimum, which is 124 cities, including Paris, or more if some of them decide to go there, and five of them have already decided to join the metropolis, it will create the metropolis of the Grand Paris, or the Cranberry metropolis. Uh, when I read the PowerPoint two weeks ago, I noted that it should be 6.7 million inhabitants. As I said, five municipalities have decided last week to join it, so now it's 7 million inhabitants. And I, as I said previously, uh, 800 square kilometers. So it is on the way. It should be set up on the 1st January, on the 1st of January 2016. Uh, so it's, it's coming very soon. There's a lot of discussion at the, at the moment between the elected members uh, who take part in the um, authority that has been set up by the law to prepare the setup of the metropolis. So they ask the government to um, organize slightly differently the cooperation between the territories. So the, these groups of municipalities that have decided to cooperate and the metropolis. So the, this, the debate is there, uh, what powers and what resources should go to the metropolis, what should remain to a, a medium scale, if I can say so. But the principle of the metropolis is accepted now. The uh, date of setup is not contested. The uh, border of it is not contested. So uh, it's really on the way, while as well as the Grand Paris Express project is on the way. And I'm sure that in 30 years, uh, it will be it. And we'll all come, you all come to Paris to, to check.
Thank you. Thank you, Katrin, uh, for sharing your insights. Uh, we're going to move very quickly now to our uh, facilitated uh, discussion. Um, first, I'd like to introduce tonight's respondents, uh, Teresa Enright and Larry Clay. Teresa Enright is an assistant professor at the, in the University of Toronto's Department of Political Science. She holds a BA from Ma McMaster University and a PhD from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Teresa's research is situated at the intersection of critical theory and urban politics with particular foci on transit-oriented development, megaprojects, urban democracy, and global suburbs. Her rec recent publications have appeared in the journals Environment and Planning, A, uh, Antipode, and the Cambridge Journal of Regions, Economy and Society. She's currently working on a book uh, manuscript entitled the Making of Grand, of Grand Paris, French Urbanism in the 21st Century. Larry Clay was appointed Assistant Deputy Minister of the Ontario Growth Secretary in July 2013. As Assistant Deputy Minister, Larry oversees the management and implementation of the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The award-winning growth plan, unique in North America, is a legislated framework to guide and shape growth in Toronto and the Greater, Greater Golden Horseshoe region. Its policies are designed to curb urban sprawl, support economic growth, reduce congestion, congestion and maximize infrastructure investments across all levels of government. Prior to joining OGS, Larry worked as the director of the Central Municipal Services Office at the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing where he oversaw municipal service delivery, governance issues, and land use planning approvals in the greater Toronto area, including implementing the growth plan, green belt plan, and the Oak Ridges Moraine Conservation Plan. Tressa? Excellent. Um, so thank you for that presentation, and thank you to the organizers as well for putting on such a fantastic event tonight. Um, the rich discussions that have been occurring over Grand Paris for the past seven years have been influential in redefining not just French, but global conversations about urbanism. And I think it's, it's clear that this radical reorganization of the Paris region can be productively considered alongside plans for the future of metropolitan Toronto as well. And despite their disparate histories, these two cities have much to learn from one another. Um, now, it's a vast understatement to say that transportation has been on the minds of Torontonians as of late. Um, indeed, from the chambers of City Hall to corner uh, bus shelters, transit has dominated public dialogue, not just as a municipal election issue, but as a decisive element in scenarios for long-term regional viability and as a pressing concern of daily life. So in the current climate of frustration and patience and with the incoming mayor perhaps a hesitant hope, it's refreshing to look at Paris as an example of a metropolis that's been able to establish and implement this ambitious transit strategy. Um, so it's clear that transit in Toronto is at an impasse. Uh, the steady removal of the state from transportation-related sectors in Canada over the past 30 years has limited the possibilities for cities to construct and operate essential infrastructure. And report after report um, has found that government investment at both the federal and provincial levels have not kept pace with rapid population growth and with the increase in ridership. And that as a result, the Toronto region, which used to be a leader in transit systems, now ranks among the worst performers both nationally and globally. And despite some recent signs that this may be changing, uh, the Ontario government stated commitments to infrastructure and a recent white paper, for example, from the federal NDP that outlines their transit-driven urban vision for Canada, neither level of government has sufficiently recognized the essential role that cities play as engines in the 21st century and provided adequate resources to facilitate their thriving. Um, so by comparison, the state regional agreement on the Grand Paris Express is remarkable for its assertion uh, that state-funded transit is a cornerstone of metropolitan endeavors. 
and it offers us an example of how deep-seated institu interinstitutional obstacles can be overcome through national vision and collaboration and cooperation at multiple scales, even in a climate of austerity. Um, in addition to places like Toronto that are struggling to adapt car-oriented and rigidly zoned spaces to the realities of the 21st century, uh, Grand Paris models a new paradigm for urbanism, and one that's based on the pursuit of a polycentric, transit-networked city that's composed of integrated, compact, and mixed-use communities. And this entails a comprehensive approach to planning and public policy that links questions of engineering efficiency with those of the location and nature of jobs and housing, how and where goods and services are produced and delivered, with the constitution of urban natural ecosystems, and with the very shape of democratic institutions. And so that the texts of Grand Paris that we have just went over make it clear that transit is not merely thought of as being a technology that moves people efficiently from point A to point B, but above all, transit and mobility are social relations. And I think Grand Paris thus offers to Toronto a broad framework for conceptualizing the complexities of transit uh, beyond the narrow terms and petty posturing of a subways versus light rail debate. Um, and moreover, to Toronto, where amalgamation remains an open question and the exaggerated divides between downtown and suburbs, the 416 and the 905, um, intensify fragmentation among the six million plus residents of the GTA who are unable to envision a shared destiny, uh, this Grand Paris plan presents a metropolitan dream that overcomes the symbolic and material dichotomies of the central city and its others. And so indeed, by inserting that Paris is its suburb, uh, this opens up this uh, suburbanization as an, if not the key emerging frontier for concerted policy and action. And this outward-looking perspective suggests doing away with old territorial hierarchies and the need to ensure the advantages of the city and city living are available and accessible to all. And so, despite these laudable aspects forever, however, I think there's some reasons to resist hastily responding to the injunction, as J.P. Morgan Chase uh, phrased it in a recent investor's report, all aboard the Grand Paris Express. Um, so in the remaining minute or two that I have to speak, I just want to suggest maybe some reasons for caution by raising two important issues um, that haven't yet been fully worked out, and these were also concerns that I think um, were raised already. So the first issue I want to raise concerns these paired goals of solidarity and competition. In a neoliberal climate where the efficient management of markets and the production of spaces conducive to private economic prosperity qualities that are reflected in global cities' rankings, for example, uh, when these are the dominant bases for democratic legitimacy, Grand Paris's coterminous aims of making the region more inclusive and more attractive represents a tenuous compromise. And in general, the economic aspects of the plan have been well articulated and translated into actionable policy, while the social goals are less well developed and less enforced. So we have these targets of new housing, for example, have yet to be met, and there's the option of wealthy municipalities to buy out of affordability provisions. Um, and I think this tension is an expression of the fact that the ambitions of economic competitiveness and social service provision are often not complementary, but sometimes they're in fact in contradiction with one another. Um, in Toronto, as in Paris, the exigencies of connecting the metropolis are clear. Um, what remains to be seen, however, is whether or not public finance can be channeled to subsidize uh, a universal collective consumption need of the population at large. And I think in order to achieve this, we have to continue to critically analyze how it is that economic growth and investment will be tied to social and ecological development, and the extent to which this techno-utopian dream of having an innovative, smart infrastructure will substantively address the uneven character of regional mobility by restructuring not just the urban form, but social geographies of inequality related to class, as well as those of race, age, gender, and ability. And so the second concern I want to raise is that of metropolitan democracy. Grand Paris professes the virtues of civic participation and the need for residents to have a say in the decisions that affect their lives. Um, and to this end, there's been an effort to include public debates and consultations at each stage of the planning process. However, there have also been criticisms of the effectiveness of these rituals of participation. Critics highlight the crucial distinction between attending a meeting, for example, and having genuine capacity to affect the direction and outcome of change. 
In Paris and in Toronto, it often remains a complex of real estate and development firms, architects, bureaucrats, and financial institutions that dictate the terms of change and decide the trajectories of transit and surrounding city transformations. And the lack of sub substantive citizen power deprives inhabitants of their right to the city. And I think this is the right that was uh, demanded most visibly in the 2005 suburban riots, which I think are an important subtext to this entire project. So the question remains then of how to build institutions that enable all inhabitants to have this substantive influence over transit governance and more generally over the amalgam of, amalgam of processes that make up contemporary urbanization today. So when Sar uh, President Sarkozy first introduced the Grand Paris project, he described it as addressing nothing less than, quote, the greatest challenge to politics of the 21st century, end quote. And insofar as Grand Paris takes up his daunting task of rethinking how and to what end the contemporary city is made, I think this description seems apt. Uh, the debates sur surrounding Grand Paris project involve a deep examination of political, perhaps the essentially political questions, what is the city, how are cities made, and who benefits from these transformations? And I think that revisiting these big questions um, will hopefully get us all moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa and Larry, if you wouldn't uh, mind as well. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine, for an uh, outstanding presentation this evening. I, uh, I was struck by a whole number of things, uh, and, and I thought about this stuff beforehand, but while you were speaking, two things from your presentation just popped up. And one of them was revenue and governance, right? How do you pay for all this stuff, and what kind of an institutional structure do you put around to make it happen? I mean, it just sounds so easy when you talk about it. If we could just take that and apply it here, just raise taxes and just make one big government, that would just be great. Well, that's not very practical, is it? That's, uh, that uh, is something that I think we in this geography have been challenged with over the years. But the one thing that I would point out uh, that, that struck me very much in your presentation was the degree to which we are so similar. You know, you think about some of the challenges that we're experiencing in this area, and you think about, and I listened to some of the challenges and opportunities that, that you reflected on in the Paris area, and it's, it's amazing how similar they are. Um, we are all interested in containing sprawl uh, and, and preserving what's important to us in terms of rural land, agricultural land, environmentally sensitive land, how important that is and how we manage the growth that's happening. How can, you know, this, these major metropolitan areas experience congestion and what that means and how do we tackle that issue? Transit and infrastructure, what do we need? Where do we put it? How do we pay for it? And how does that impact on affordability? One of the things that you, you talked a little bit about was housing and that's what we're sort of challenged in this geography and in this area is how do we provide a range of housing options and choice that are affordable for the people who want to live here and want to live in different parts of this region. And the one other thing that's really important is planning for employment. It's not just where people live, it's where they work. And how do you connect those two dots? So it's fascinating to me how similar those issues are and then when I think about not only the Greater Golden Horseshoe, which I'm uh, very deeply involved in, but if you think about what's happening in other parts of Canada, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, um, you think of what's happening in the US, Chicago, LA, Denver, Washington, New York, all these places are starting to turn to regional planning because they're all experiencing degrees of growth and they're all finding themselves facing similar issues and similar challenges to what we're facing here and what we collectively are trying to struggle with. Uh, in 2005, the province brought forward the growth plan. I think everyone in this room probably knows a little bit about the growth plan. Um, at its, in its time, it was new. It was all about smart growth and it was new urbanism. It was bringing an institutional framework to the kind of growth and development that we all would agree we're trying to achieve. Since that time, no longer new. 
Everyone's doing it. This is just fundamentally good planning. So we're into the next generation. The concept has spread across different jurisdictions in North America. It has spread across different jurisdictions in Europe. And we're all sort of having um, the same sort of challenges. And it's, while it's new here, I know you were mentioning in your presentation that you, know, you guys in Paris we started this in the 60s and the 70s. You've got a long history of trying to address some of these challenges, as have we. Um, and the one of the things I say about using challenges, what I'm trying to do in here is change challenges to opportunities. We all talk about all the different difficulties of challenges, but how do we flip that on its head and turn that into opportunities? How do we actually start maximizing uh, the investments that we're making? How do we maximize uh, where and how people want to live in this area? Um, and the other part that's really important is partnerships. In Paris, what I'm seeing is increasingly you're starting to look at how you work together, how you're going to establish those partnerships between and amongst municipalities, between and amongst regions, and between and amongst all the different players that contribute to urban form, urban design, and urban development. So as we go forward, uh, I know you want to, I'm, I'm not going to take up any more time because I know you want to have at least an opportunity to ask Catherine particularly some questions, but it's really all about, you know, what kind of, um, how do we want to live? How do we put in place the kind of policies that actually get us there? And how do we establish those kinds of partnerships that we need? We can't do it all ourselves. Different levels of government here are challenged for a variety of different things. Um, institutional organizations, uh, NGOs, different municipalities, we all have a part to play. How do we bring everybody together and work together in a partnership um, format that actually advances collectively what we're all trying to achieve? I think that's really critical. So part of the for these forums are wonderful. We get an opportunity to share best practices. We can learn from each other. We can share what works. We can share what doesn't work. Um, and I can come back to my, my original thought is that we are all very similar in the sorts of things that we're trying to achieve. So let's figure out a way in which we can actually work together and, and support each other. So. So I think this would be a good time for, I'm sure, Catherine, you, you have a few answers to some of the questions that have been raised. Uh, I think it'd be a good time for all of us to um, move to the stage and to um, discuss this a little bit. And then we'll have time for a few uh, questions from the audience after that. So to begin with, uh, I'm going to pass the microphone to Catherine because I'm sure there were a few comments that were made uh, by both Teresa and, and Larry that you might want to respond to. Well, I'm quite ready to answer the questions of the audience because uh, I've not, not much to say to Larry and Teresa. I quite agree, of course, with what they said, and I, I think it is a general phenomenon in all metropolises in the in the in the world, not only in the Western world, I think in Asia, it's also the same process as far I've seen in, uh, in Beijing and Shanghai. So it's a general process that metropolises are trying to organize better their, um, their development. And so the regional planning and transit planning are becoming more and more accurate and more and more uh, important and uh, accepted, not important, they've always been important in my opinion, but they were not that accepted as they are now. So that's important, an important phenomenon and I've noticed, and I was glad to know that in Toronto, it's the same process as what we, as what we are experiencing in the Paris region, but also as what I've seen in the London region 15 years ago and in Berlin where I have al also many connections. So let's hope that it will just carry on Great, so then what I try to do here is, is um, just open really up to the audience for, for any questions. There's a few over here. You said at the top of the talk that there's about 11.7 million people in the, in the sort of larger you said there was about 11.7 million people in this larger 
Paris region, and then the metropolis you described as more around seven million. And then you were, so that suggests that almost 50%, maybe a little bit less than 50% of um, inhabitants outside are in that opt out. Um, and so my question is, what would incentivize them to actually opt in and what would be, it's not really a word, but what, what are some of the obstacles in which they would not opt into the, to the metro, metro uh, region? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. As I told you, uh, there are many municipalities. There are a very small number of inhabitants. As you noticed, uh, the, um, the sociology of the population is very different from one, one municipality to another. And so uh, the strategy of each municipality is different. Some think that the uh, grand Greater Paris metropolis is a good opportunity for them to join a general movement of development. Uh, and it's not necessarily a um, socialist municipality or conservative municipalities. The municipality of Shell, which, is a, uh, which has a newly uh, elected mayor who is uh, a conservator, has decided to join uh, the Greater Paris Authority and other ones have taken opposite decisions, probably because uh, they think that the inhabitants don't want to get more uh, inhabitants living on the territory of the municipality. So it's probably a sort of NIMBY phenomenon at that stage, but I'm not totally sure because the process is not finished yet. Uh, I have a question that really follows directly on, along from that one. Uh, Andre Sorensen from the Department of Geography. Uh, about the, the powers of those small municipalities, and that was really, it's quite extraordinary, the fragmentation of the municipalities. But that isn't that important if they don't have significant powers over uh, planning. Uh, and I mean, before the decentralization of the 80s, the, most of the, the planning for the region was really coming from top down. So how the, what, what are the powers of municipalities now and w how significant is that, uh, is that local power for being able to carry out your, the plan? The municipalities, whatever their size is and the number of inhabitants, have all powers. I've been director of planning of the city of Paris, so I can tell you that we have the planning power, we make the local plan, and okay, the local plan has to respect the regulations of the regional plan, but until a few years ago, there was no uh, time, there was no delay to adapt the local plan to the regional plan, and, uh, and the state uh, is supposed to enforce this obligation to, incorp to, take, um, to incorporate the regulations of the regional plan into the local plan, if, if the state doesn't do the job, the local plan can be different. So they have the planning policy, the, the planning competence, planning power, but they have also the, uh, the uh, authority to deliver planning permissions. And many mayors um, take a lot of time to deliver planning permissions when they think that the planning permission brings too many new dwellings, for instance, on the territory of their municipality, and that either the inhabitants don't want that, so they will attack the planning permission, which often happens, or that the municipality will have to spend a lot of money to build new school or new day nursery to take care of the children brought by these new dwellings. So it's the competence, the powers, are really at the level of the municipalities nowadays. And the process that we are engaged in is to bring some of these powers, the strategic powers, to a higher level so that the concurrence between the municipality will stop and that also um, 
the strategic decisions like building more dwellings in the central part of the Paris region should be taken because at the moment, if we build not enough dwellings, it's mainly because the local municipality don't give the building rights or don't give the planning permission quickly enough. Hi, my name is Astra Burka and I'm an architect. And um, here in this country, we don't have a, a federal policy on transportation. And that seems to be one of the major problems. And then we don't think provincially and then municipal municipally like you do in France where it's all one line <coughs> thinking the same way. So we start at the bottom up and I've been still looking in Toronto we have discussions about three stops or seven stops when they go nowhere and stop at nothing. We can't even get a long-term vision plan. And I'm trying to think, what is, how can we get to that stage? Because all we're talking about <coughs> are bit meal pieces. I have never seen a vision plan, and I don't know, do you plan into the future a whole connectivity? Because we seem to be disconnected when we plan here. And I'm trying to think, how can we get more connected? Well, don't be desperate because uh, it has, during many, many, many years, there has been no proper political decisions in terms of transit in the Paris region. The last important decision have been taken at the end of the 1980s uh, when the government decided to finance two projects that would in fact were concurrent. Uh, and it was not so a very visionary decision. Uh, the, the last line of the Paris metros that has been built, li line 14, and also the RER line named E. So that's the last decision that had been taken. The works have been achieved uh, at the beginning of the mid 1990s and then nothing until this uh, Grand Paris Act of 2010. And in terms of governance, it's even worse. The General de Gaulle government has uh, destroyed the governance that was at that time um, organizing the Paris region with the Département de la Seine, the Seine County, that has been split in three pieces in 1965, and since then, there was no governance of the metropolis fitted to the um, issues of a, of a metropolis of that size until the new Metropolitan Act that has been passed this year. My name's Janet Mason. I'm with the School of Public Policy and Governance. I just, I have a question that's following up on why the small municipalities may or may not want to share the planning. And I know this all relative on the matter of uh, visionary vision planning. Does the regional plan that you describe actually allocate the buildings in the larger centers? And does it, I mean, I'm comparing it to ours, and does it have something like the green belt that would The regional planning in the Paris region um, is fairly ambitious. It has always been in different, different directions, but it has always been. Uh, and the regional plan that has been adopted at the end of last year is very ambitious in terms of protection, protecting rural areas and also concentrating urbanization in the central zone and especially around the stations. The problem is that this regional plan is um, designed at a scale which is not a good scale. As I, told you, as I showed you, the scale is the scale of the Paris region with 12,000 square kilometers. 80% uh, of it is rural area and uh, natural areas. So it's very good to uh, prevent the sprawl, to um, protect rural areas, and it has been fairly successful since it 
this regional plan existed because the first one was set up in the 1960s, uh, but it's not so good to organize the urbanization and the intensification of the central area of the Paris metropolis. That's why it's, I expect the Par Grand, greater Paris metropolis, which will have the power to make the strategic plan to be more adapted to the challenges of the metropolitan area itself. It's just a question of scale. Hi, my name is Carmen and I'm a PhD planning student here at the University of Toronto. And I have two questions that perhaps speak to the social uh, impact of this plan. And the first is, I was struck by the, um, by the slide that, that showed housing over a metro station, um, because that's something I haven't seen in Toronto, but actually have seen in Montreal where I live. And it's in, it's in a low income housing neighborhood. So I was curious to know um, what models you're basing this on and uh, what, what type of housing you envision this being, if it might be social housing, uh, mixed income, so more elaboration there. And my second question is about affordability for users and if um, perhaps if this hasn't been projected, if the costs would be more in line with the metro system in Paris, which I think is actually quite affordable compared to Toronto, or the RER system, which is slightly more expensive for the subsistence. I didn't understand all of your questions, as you noticed, I've asked some help, but my neighbor hasn't perhaps heard everything also. So if I understood, there were two questions, one about uh, the price of transit, and another one about housing. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, the, the housing will built on top of the metro station is very little. It's just to give you an example that there are some possibilities. But the housing potential uh, around the station in this, radio, in this circle of 800 meter radius I show you on the map, uh, it's much more important. And this is potential that we have to mobilize. And to mobilize it, we first have to make a sort of analysis, a diagnostic to know uh, where are the potentials, where are the, um, the, the premises at, that are not being built very densely, uh, that could be converted, like brownfields, for instance. Though we're doing the job at the moment with the, um, the urban planning agency that is called APUR, Atelier Parisien d'Urbanisme, and uh, it's called the Observatory of the Station Neighborhoods, we've called it. And um, we are, um, well, I have some documents I can give to those who are interested in it. So it's, the idea is to document as clearly and precisely as possible with maps and all sorts of maps at the, at the level of um, parcels of land uh, so that um, we could see the density, the potential, the status of ownership, that sort of information. And we're sharing that information with all the municipalities that have station of the, in the Grand Prix project. But we're sharing that information also with the professional, professionals, developers, uh, investors, so that uh, um, a good process of sharing the knowledge and taking the good decisions of investment could start. And it has started. And it's, it will probably be very effective. So we, we hope, but we not only hope, we do all what we can to, um, to be sure that the process of building housing in the surroundings of the new stations will start 
not only on the stations, but in the surrounding, in these 200 hectares I, I show you on the map previously. Um, and it has started. Uh, the other question is about the, the fairs. Um, we don't know yet, because uh, the Société du Comparé is building the new metro, but it won't run it. Uh, it will run, uh, the society that will run the Grand Metro hasn't been chosen yet because we have to have a European competition. Uh, there's some probabilities that it should be the Metro, uh, the RRTP, but nobody knows. But anyway, the level of the fares uh, will be decided by the um, regional transit authority, the stiff Syndicat des Transports d'Ile-de-France. Um, and this fair policy, uh, the stiff fair policy is changing at the moment. Um, it hasn't been changed yet, but the stiff is, the chairman of the stiff is also the chairman of the regional authority in, in the Paris region. And the regional authority has a majority that is socialist and um, Green Party, and the Green Party has imposed to the socialist president that the fair system should be totally changed and that there should be just one, uh, one fair for the whole region. So it is not decided yet. There's a lot of pressure from the Green Party to make the decision to be taken. Uh, and of course, a lot of pressure from the conservative it not to be taken. But it's a real change that hasn't been occurred yet. If it occurred, normally, the fares of the Grand Paris project should be included in the fares of the region. And uh, in, the, um, in the past, we buy, most of us buy every, every month to uh, navigate on the, world, on the whole network. So there's no answer, but uh, we'll know very soon. Okay, you mentioned a growth rate of 70,000 units a year, um, which strikes me as a, a fairly aggressive rate of construction. And I'm wondering if that is an aggressive target uh, and how dependent the transportation viability is on that rate of growth. So if you, by way of comparison, it's seven million people, roughly the population base, at 70,000 units a year. In Ontario, we maybe produce about 70,000 units in a good year, compared to a population base of quite a bit more. Well, the 70,000 uh, dwellings a year um, is a political target, as you noticed. Uh, but it's a very strong political target because it has been added to the Grand Paris Act uh, in the first article during the debate in Parliament. So it shows uh, the concern of the politicians. Politicians are all concerned by the fact that there are not enough dwellings being built, too, too strong perhaps, being built at the moment in the Paris region. Um, and uh, there's a large demand for more housing and for affordable housing close to the employment areas. So, um, is, a, it, is it too high? Probably. But um, that sort of commitment is also interesting because uh, in some ways um, it gives bad consciousness to the municipality that don't want to contribute to it. And it gives um, the, the national authority, the regional level, and very soon the metropolitan political level, the possibility to uh, oblige these municipalities to uh, contribute to, 
to this uh, objective. So um, sometimes it's good to have some very iconic figures just to start a process that yet hasn't started, I can say. Okay, th thank you so much, uh, Catherine, Teresa, and uh, um, Larry. <laughs> Apologies for that. Uh, and thank you so much for the uh, organizers of this fabulous event. I think there will be plenty of opportunities uh, to continue this conversation downstairs at, at the reception. Um, in the meantime, uh, a big round of applause for a wonderful event. Thank you.